Welcome everyone to the Judiciary Committee hearing. This is part of the second special session of 2021. My name is Carl Rhodes. I'm chair of the Judiciary Committee. This Zoom meeting and YouTube live stream event is for the Judiciary Committee's 1 p.m. agenda on Governor's Message Number 2, the judicial appointment of Sonia N.P. McCollum to the Intermediate Court of Appeals for a 10-year term. The other members of the Judiciary Committee are Vice Chair Keo Kalole, uh, members Acasio, Gabbard, Lee, Kim, and Favela, who are either all here or are planning to be here soon. As noted, this hearing is being streamed live on YouTube. You can find links to viewing options for all Senate hearings and meetings on the live and on-demand video page of the Honolulu Legislature's website. If you're interested in seeing the written testimony, you can go to the Legislature's website, www.capital.hawaii.gov, capitals with an O, and follow the links to the 2021 second special session. In the unlikely event that we have to abruptly end this hearing due to major technical difficulties, the, committee's, the committee will reconvene on Thursday, August 26 at 9.30 a.m., and a public notice will be posted on the Legislature's website. For the people testifying remotely, all testifier audio will be muted and video disabled until it's your turn to testify. For the committee's practice, uh, this is, there is a two minute limit on oral testimony per testifier. Uh, if you can stay around until the uh, those who are zooming in, and there's not that many today, um, member, I and other members may have questions for you if you have the time to stay. If there are temporary technical glitches during your turn to testify, we may have to move on to the next person but we appreciate your understanding and remind you that the committee has already received your written testimony. We will try to come back to you though um, before we give up on hearing your oral testimony. I'll be reading a list of people who submitted written testimony for each measure. We apologize that the closed captioning doesn't accurately transcribe the names. Again, if you're interested in seeing the written testimony, you can go to the legislature's website, which is capital.hawaii.gov and follow the links to the 2021 a second, a second special session. And uh, for everyone's information, there will be no vote today. Um, we haven't, uh, once once the GM2 is formally referred to the Judiciary Committee, we can vote and that will be tomorrow. So the vote will be tomorrow um, at 10.30 a.m. via Zoom. Okay. I think we can get started on the testifiers. First up is Emmy Morita Alkai, who I believe has signed up to testify in person. There you are. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Emmy Morita Alkai. I'm an attorney licensed to practice in Hawaii. I've known Sonia for over 20 years. We went to law school together and we served um, as a law clerk together at the Hawaii Supreme Court. Sonia has my strong recommendation. She's intelligent, professional, highly qualified, and hardworking, and she will make an outstanding judge for the Intermediate Court of Appeals. Thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. Next up is Melanie K. McKenzie for Native Hawaiian Bar Association. I believe I saw her too. Hello, oh, Chair. Go ahead. Go ahead. Aloha Chair Rhodes and Vice Chair Keo Kalole and members of the Senate Judiciary Committee. I will make this very brief. I am uh, testifying today on behalf of the Native Hawaiian Bar Association. I'm a past president and I'm a member of the current Board of Directors. Um, and as you probably know, the NHBA Native Hawaiian Bar Association is an association of lawyers, judges, and other legal professionals of Hawaiian ancestry that seeks to promote excellence, unity, cooperation, education, and the exchange of ideas among its members and in the larger community. The board highly recommends the confirmation of Sonia McClellan as an associate judge of the Intermediate Court of Appeals. I'm sure others will talk about her extensive experience as an appellate attorney. I just wanna emphasize the point that that experience will certainly enable her to smoothly transition to being an Intermediate Court of Appeals judge and to help the ICA to address the significant backlog that they have. Um, she also brings her experience of being raised on a neighbor island, as well as teaching in YNI. She's a compassionate person of good moral character with excellent appellate experience. And we believe that she will, uh, we're confident that she will do so uh, in filling the current position with diligence, competence, and humility. 
So thank you so much. And we strongly uh, urge this committee to support her nomination. Mahalo. Thank you. Next is Stephen Tsushima. Pretty sure I saw him too. Are you there? Go ahead, go ahead. Good afternoon, Chair and committee members. Uh, I'll submit on my written testimony. I just wanted to make myself available in case the committee had any questions for me about my comments. Right. Thank you very much. Thank Next you. Is Stephen, Stephen Alm, prosecuting attorney for the City and County of Honolulu. Good afternoon. Good, good afternoon, Chair Rhodes, uh, Vice Chair Kioho Kalole, and members of the committee. I do speak in strong support of, of Sonia McClellan for this position. We will hate to <clears throat> lose her here. She has been one of the real workhorses as far as doing so much appellate work for years. But I think her, you know, she's down to earth. She's smart. She's compassionate. She's going to be the last one to toot her own horn. Uh, but she is one who really walks the walk. And uh, I think that she showed that starting with her first career teaching at YNI High School and, uh, you know, getting a sense of how the students need help and working with them. And she's just done a great job here. So I, I can't speak more highly uh, of Sonia and I look forward to her joining the ICA, which as you know, is such a workhorse now uh, for handling all the appeals first off. So I'll be available later if there are any questions, but thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next is Jill Leilani Nunokawa. Good afternoon, go ahead. Good afternoon, Senators. Sonia is eminently suited and exceeds all requirements for this crucial, uh, crucial judicial position. Sonia bridges gaps of inequalities. Sonia is acutely aware of the complexities of law and the communities they affect in real time. From Hilo to Honolulu, Puna to Punahou, Koloa to Ka'anapali, we are all Hawaii. Former State Representative Marcus Oshiro once said, there's no difference between what an I and what a lie. And although I like to believe his words one day to ring true, until such time, the Intermediate Court of Appeals will be a court that will handle not just the breadth of cases, but cases of first impression. The judiciary will be forced to render justice in unjust systems at, during unjust times, have to reconcile common law with future technologies, Dr. King wrote in 1947, we must remember that intelligence is not enough. Intelligence plus character, that's the goal of true education. The complete education gives one not only power of concentration, but worthy objectives upon which to concentrate. The broad education will therefore transmit to one not only the accumulated knowledge of race, but also the accumulated experience of social living. Sonia's accumulated experience of social living is a vast in breadth and depth. She brings a wealth of legal acumen specific to the appellate realm, unquestionable integrity, character, and humility, lessons from public to private, rural to urban, fully able to disabled, disenfranchised to empowered. I mahalo Sonia for her unwavering belief that her efforts matter and she can translate the practice of law into the interpretation of law so as to improve the lives for all peoples in Hawaii. Thank you, senators, for your courage in the last vote, your consideration for this nomination, and the content. Thank, thank you very much. The time's expired. Uh, next up is Elena Bryant, who I saw. I think I just shut myself off here. There we go. Aloha, Aloha yes, Chair. Yes, Aloha Chair, Vice Chair, and Committee Members. I'm Elena Bryant, testifying in my personal capacity as a member of our state bar since 2011, as a Native Hawaiian woman, and as a mother. I strongly support Governor Ige's nomination of Sonia McCullen to the Intermediate Court of Appeals. I know Ms. McCullen through participating in the Ete Bowl, having competed against her as an Ete on the law school team, and also alongside her as a fellow bruiser. I'm confident she will bring the same determination, grit, and aloha to the courtroom that she brings to the football field. In addition to her resolve and aloha, Ms. McCullen has significant practice and lived experience. These qualities make her an ideal candidate to serve as an appellate court judge. 
Ms. McCullen has a wealth of practice experience and appellate experience in particular. According to public data, she has handled hundreds of appeals. There is no substitute for actual practice experience, and Ms. McCullen's significant appellate experience would enable her to hit the ground running and immediately help to address the ICA's significant case backlog. She would also bring a depth of lived experience to the ICA. It's vital that Hawaii's people see themselves represented at every level of government, including the ICA. Her appointment brings much needed diversity of, and perspective to our appellate court. She's a native Hawaiian woman, a mother, someone who grew up in Hilo, a former teacher of Hawaiian language and Hawaiian studies at Wai'anae High School. Like myself, she's also a Hawaiian studies graduate. And given that the appellate courts increasingly hear issues of great importance to the native Hawaiian community, this background and perspective is invaluable and much needed on our appellate bench. Ms. McCullen is Kupa Aina of and from this place, and for the first time in far too long, the native Hawaiian community will see someone from their own community who shares and understands the unique culture and values of that community on the appellate bench. If confirmed, Ms. McCullen will be an amazing role model for Native Hawaiian women and little girls like my own daughter because for the first time in the history of the ICA, we'll be able to see ourselves at the appellate court level. Please vote to confirm her today and mahalo for your time. I'll be available for any questions. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Vice Chair Keo Kaloli, was there an additional Zoom witness that you wish to add? I, I believe my uh, my office is trying to help someone uh, with their link. Okay. All right. Let me know if, uh, if I miss them. Uh, so, members, let's go ahead and ask questions of this group of testifiers that we just heard. If, if anybody has any, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed one. I apologize. Marnie Townsend for the Sierra Club of Hawaii. Are you still? Yeah, there you are. Go ahead. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Senator. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Um, you will hear a lot today um, in verbal testimony, and you've also seen it in our own written testimony, uh, the accolades for uh, Ms. McCullen. Uh, we think she's great, and we're urging you to uh, confirm her. Uh, I just want to take this moment to really thank you all. I realize that the the GM1 vote uh, was very difficult and uncomfortable and really shined a light on some issues that Hawaii really needs to deal with. And I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank you all for um, not going, you know, not taking the easy route out um, to really confronting these issues and helping us to make the best possible choice. Uh, both for our judiciary and for our community and to help us in our reconciliation process as we move forward. Thank you very much. And uh, once again, I strongly, the Sierra Club strongly supports um, GM2 and hopes that you will vote to confirm Sonia McCullen. Thank you. And Thank I'll you. be available to answer questions later. Great. Thank you. Uh, members, okay, look, for, uh, for this group of testifiers, any questions for the uh, seven people, I guess, who have testified so far? Six people. Seven. Seven. Sorry. Any questions? Okay, if not, thank you very much all of you for being here. We appreciate your taking the time to come and talk to us. And I will continue on down the, uh, the testifier list. Next is Amanda Furman uh, in support, the Filipino Law Students Association in support, Wayne Tanaka in support, Dayton Sito Myers in support, Amy Sojo or Soyo in support, Rhiannon Terra, Terra Ari e. Chandler Eow in support, Tracy Kane or Kane in support, Maritas Kaji in support, Darcy Coronel in support, Shana Delima Suganuma in support, Brandy Delima Suganuma also in support, uh, Teresa Sanchez in support, Leah Hong in support, Ha'aheo Kaho'ohala Hala in support, Kathy Silva in support, Kipukai Kualii, uh, council member from Kauai County in support, Susan Long in support, Sandra, Sandra Ann Wong in support, Sterling Wong in support, Kuhio Lewis, President and CEO, Council for Native Hawaiian Advancement in support, Michelle Shimoda in support, Alan Lemoni Fisher in support, Tiffany Gurley Carter in support, Shannon DeCosta in support, DeCosta in support, in support, Michelle McCoy in support, Richard Stacey in support, Sharon Nishi in support, John Yamano in support, Shanda DaCosta also in support, Leighton Hara in support, Jed Kumagai in support. And Karen Chong Morgan in support. Okay, and then we have um, Maui Council Member Keani Rollins, I believe, is joining us by Zoom. Go ahead, um, Council Member. 
Aloha, uh, Chair Rhodes. Okay. Aloha, Chair Rhodes, uh, Vice Chair Kyoho Kalole, and Honorable Members of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, Ova Okiani Rollins Fernandez, uh, Maui County Council Member from Molokai. I'm testifying uh, in strong support of Governor Ige's nomination of Sonia McCullen to the ICA for all the reasons um, that previous testifiers have eloquently outlined. Um, I believe that she is highly qualified um, and will represent us well on the ICA in uh, decision making. Uh, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I really just wanted to testify in person to thank you all uh, for making this nomination possible for your courage. Um, and mahalo to Governor Ige for um, his nomination of Ms. McKellen. Mahalo for this opportunity to testify. Thank you very much. Members, any questions for Council Member Rollins Fernandez? Seeing none, thank you for being here. And I'll go ahead and on down the testifier list. Uh, Noreen, Noreen Matanani in support, Taryn Tomasa in support, Crystal A. Hessler in support, Kimmy Murphy Ide Foster in support, Kohai Nuuhiba Campbell in support, Catherine Vessels in support, Latani Peltier in support, Lauren Velasteros Montanabe in support, Crystal Glendon in support, Kapua Ala Sprout in support, Troy Andrade in support, Hawaii Women Lawyers in support, P.E. Lani Kai in support, In He Alani Sonoda Pale for Kalahui Hawaii Political Action Committee in support, Shannon Rudolph, Michelle Pu'u, both in support, Rochelle Vedina, Vedinha, Cheryl Burkhart, Ryan Oshita, all in support, Stephen Tevis in support, Sharde Freitas in support, Trisha Nakamatsu in support. And that brings us to the Hawaii State Bar Association. Uh, Levi Ho'okano, I believe, is here. Yes, Chair. Afternoon, go ahead. All right, good afternoon, uh, Chair Rhodes, Vice Chair Kyo Hokolole, and members of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Mahalo for the opportunity to testify. Uh, so the Hawaii State Bar Association, we did review Ms. McCullen's questionnaires, her application to the JSC. Uh, we spoke with her references and interviewed Ms. McCullen. And through all that, we have found her to be qualified for the position of Associate Judge of the Intermediate Court of Appeals. Uh, her time as a teacher at Waianae High School has demonstrated her organizational skills, communication skills, time management, integrity, collegiality, and her even keelness, uh, as well as her time as an attorney. She has demonstrated ability with the appeals process. Uh, her writing is excellent, and as her references have all testified uh, to her ability to do the job and the experiences necessary to serve on the Speed of Court of Appeals. Uh, she has excellent research ability and the ability to research varied areas of law when she has to. Uh, I'd be available for any questions you have, but again, the Hawaii State Bar Association Board of Directors found Ms. McCullen to be qualified for this position. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ho'okano. Members, any questions for Mr. Ho'okano? Okay, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, Chair. Ms. McCullen, I believe you are next on the uh, on the speaking agenda, if you'd like to make an opening statement, and then we may have, we will, we will have some questions for you. Uh, there you go. You're still muted. Okay, there you go. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair Rhodes, Vice Chair Ke'ohokalole, and committee members. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak today. I am honored and humbled by Governor Ige's appointment and all the support shown here today. All of this inspires in me a deep sense of kuleana and commitment that if confirmed, I will work my hardest to be the best judge I can be, to uphold the law fairly and impartially, and to serve all of Hawaii's people to the best of my abilities. At the outset, I feel I should acknowledge that I was not the initial choice for this position. The community, the legal community is small, and I know several people in the list, including Dad, whom I consider to be a longtime friend. Although I wasn't the first pick, I hope that the Senate will decide ultimately that I'm worthy of confirmation. 
As you may have seen from my resume, I'm dedicated to public service. I've dedicated most of my professional career to public service. In my 11 years working in the appellate division of the Honolulu Prosecutor's Office, I've handled many, many appeals, mostly at the ICA level. I've also argued 20 times before the Hawaii Supreme Court. And when it was suggested I get some trial experience, I volunteered for trials in addition to my appellate duties. In our office, we handle a high volume of appeals, many of which involve serious offenses and complex legal issues. Despite that constant tempo, I've always tried to uphold the standard of quality and excellence in my work. It helps that I love what I do. I, appellate work is my passion. As I see, the workflow in the ICA is very similar. As everyone knows, the ICA handles the bulk of the appeals and is currently facing a backlog. I would be ready and willing to jump in and work with my colleagues to get this work done. I understand how delays in appeals are costly and burdensome and unjust since justice delayed is justice denied. I also recognize and believe that we should not sacrifice justice for expediency by taking shortcuts like curtailing people's access to justice or glossing over their legal claims and rights. This is the fine balance and standard of excellence that the ICA needs to fulfill and, a, and I would commit to upholding this responsibility and above all the fundamental principles of justice and the rule of law. As a prosecutor, I've always seen myself as a servant of the law and the people. It is not about winning cases, but about doing justice. I've admitted when errors were made and I've conceded appeals rather than arguing positions that have no legal basis. As a judge, I would put aside my prosecutor's hat, but maintain my commitment to fairness and integrity. In addition to my qualifications, skills, and principles, I believe I bring important diversity and life experiences. I was born and raised, I went to school and worked all my life here in the islands. I'm from a working class family. My father works baggage at Aloha Airlines and my mother is a lay maker. I'm part Hawaiian on my mother's side and I'm also of Korean, Japanese, and Portuguese ancestry. I went to high school in the Big Island and then UH Manoa for college. I've had a job since I was 15 years old and worked all the way through college and law school. In undergrad, I had an interest in Hawaiian studies and Hawaiian language. Um, and I got a degree in liberal studies because back then there was no Hawaiian studies department. I then got a teaching certificate and went to Waianae High School where I taught mostly Hawaiian studies classes. I look back fondly on those years and still get together with my teacher friends. I hope I was able to contribute to the next generation as a teacher, but can say I learned so much from my students and colleagues about the real life challenges and also the pride, hope, and aspirations of a larger community. I would have been happy to continue teaching, but the law seemed like a, a new challenge. I wasn't sure what I was getting into, but it ended up being a second career. I have to say that without the Richardson School of Law and Kamehameha Scholars, it might not have been possible. I am very grateful for that. I'm also grateful for everything and everyone who helped me along this road, along the road to this moment. I'm sorry that I don't have time to mention everyone's name, but mahalo to my family and friends teachers, mentors, colleagues, and coworkers. And thank you to the JSC, HSBA, and the governor for this opportunity and for everyone who testified. As people have pointed out, if confirmed, I would be the first appellate judge of Hawaiian ancestry in decades. To be honest, that is overwhelming. But I believe that diversity is important in our democratic government. I will do my best to fulfill this kuleana contributing my part to the collective wisdom of the court. I'll conclude with a couple final thoughts. First, I'm a hard worker and have always done my best in whatever I do, whether it be working cash registers, teaching students, or practicing law while raising a family. And second, almost my entire career has been dedicated to public service. These may not have been the best paid jobs, 
but the reward was in serving people of this island community, which I am fortunate to call home. If confirmed, I will continue to work my hardest in the same spirit of public service and aloha for Hawaii and all its people. Mahalo. Thank you very much. Members, questions? I don't believe that nobody has any questions. Senator Keo Kaloli, are you, is that a hand raised or? I'll, I'll yield to Senator Lee who unmuted first. Okay, go ahead, Senator Lee. <laughs> uh, thanks. Um, first of all, congratulations, uh, Sonia, on your, your nomination. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a significant, significant uh, accomplishment. And, and anyway, I just wanna say congratulations. Um, did want to also follow up on um, just really two things that we had talked about. One, um, you know, first of all, appreciate you reaching out. I think, um, you know, in the last couple of weeks, uh, I think we had a great conversation. Um, there's one thing I'd asked about, um, in particular, I, I guess, which is sort of relevant to this committee and some stuff that we've been working on over the last couple of years, um, as we sort of rethought the criminal justice system and and really tried to improve it. Um, but I came down to a, a pretty significant recognition that uh, there are things to improve. And so I had asked um, at the time whether you believe there's systemic injustice that still exists in our judicial system in Hawaii. And um, you know, at the time you had said you had to think about it. So I want to follow up and find out, um, have you had a chance to and, and how would you answer the question now? I, I absolutely believe and I recognize that there is a problem and um, it's a very complex issue and, and the situation is pretty vast in terms of trying to address it. It's a systemic problem and it, it requires a systemic, uh, I guess, approach. I'm committed to being educated about it. I wanna learn more. I'm also committed to doing what I can within the bounds of the law. And I guess, I guess with that, why do you think Native Hawaiians in general in Hawaii end up being put in jail at a much higher rate, disproportionate to um, their share of the population? Honestly, I, I don't know. I mean, I think there's, there's a lot going on from the time they're young, you know, Hawaiians are, are young and they're faced with challenges that maybe some other families aren't faced with. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I think Senator Keo Kohli was next. Uh, yeah, I guess a similar question. What would you say to those in the community who might, you know, on the on the same criminal justice sort of wavelength, uh, what would you say to those in the community who look at your time at the prosecutor's office and express concern that your time and experience there might color your ability to make fair and impartial decisions on the appellate court? At the prosecutor's office, I've taken my role seriously, which is the servant of the law. Um, ministers of justice. Our goal is not to just get convictions or win cases. Our goal is to do what's right, to do what's just. If, so I guess in, in uh, if I can follow up on that, you know, some of those same individuals might see you as you know, coming from the prosecutor's office as part of that system that um, I guess, however you want to describe it, nets bias results against uh, people of color, especially socio socioeconomically disadvantaged people of color. So I guess what I'm asking is what can you say or, or what can you speak to or what do you intend to do to give uh, this committee and those members of the public some comfort that 
you are not in this role at the ICA going to just be a cog in that machine that continues to net out these, you know, unjust results. I recognize that the prosecutor's office and myself as part of the prosecutor's office does play a role in the, the systemic problems that exist. And I think we are trying to, like other other agencies or, or arms of the uh, judiciary, the police, uh, public defenders, prosecutors, we're all part of this um, system that I guess needs to address these uh, inadequacies or unfairness towards certain groups. And I think we're working towards that. We're working towards making the system better. I guess, how, how do you view your role on the court, though? Should you be confirmed in, in, uh, in the achievement of that eventual objective? I'm committed to doing whatever I need to do to do what's right within the bounds of the law. Okay, I'll yield. Thank okay, you. thank you, Senator Kim. Thank you, Sonia. Appreciate the time you spent with me. Um, um, so the cases that are sent to you in ICA is really assigned to you, and you have to deal with the cases as they're as you've gotten it. Correct. I believe so. I believe a panel of three is assigned to each case. And I, I believe it's random. And similarly, at the prosecutor's office, you folks are dealt or given the certain cases to deal with. You present the case in front of a judge, and ultimately the result is after the um, lawyers on both sides argue the case that the decision is finally made by by the by the courts, right? I'm sure there's other plea bargains that go on in between, but those are some of the issues as far as um, that that is part of the system that if we have to look at it we have to look at the overall system and certainly uh, judges uh, play their role prosecutors play their role but so does the defense and everybody else right now one of the things we didn't talk about when we met is um, the beginning of the pandemic um, the judiciary got very active as far as pushing to release um, prisoners uh, from our prisons uh, to avoid the spread. Um, and people in the community were very concerned that uh, many of these uh, that were being uh, released would commit crimes again, which they did, and ended up going back. And, you know, there's a big concern. Um, if that happens again, what would be your position? Respectfully, Senator, and I'm not trying to evade your question. I know it's an important uh, concern, especially with the Delta variant uh, and our high numbers, but I would have to follow the judicial code and I cannot opine on that. It could, it could happen again, like you said, and be before the courts. Well, I mean, personally, you know, would you push to release them? I mean, we've had other judges come before us, we've asked similar questions and they have in fact um, shared with us. Um, um, some of them said that they wouldn't, others said they would consider it. Um, but I mean, it, it is a concern. The public has concerns that people that uh, have been convicted are being released prematurely uh, because of COVID. And if we look at now, there's a lot more cases now than it was then. I mean, I, I'm not sure how we would balance that, but um, what would be your policy or how would you feel personally about releasing uh, convicted people early uh, because of, of, you know, simple fact of possibly um, overcrowding or them get, uh, might get COVID. I think my perspective or how I would feel would be to uphold and apply whatever law is in place at that time regarding the, the release. And I'm sorry if that 
you know, that's not a satisfactory answer, but I really oh. am yeah. no, but, the, but the law was, was sidestep. I mean, the law was there that they're there. And the judiciary made accommodations to override that. So if you're saying you're to abide by the law, they weren't really abiding by the law. They recreated the law in some sense. So as a judge, I think you've got to have some convictions. And I think when we met, you did have those. So I, you know, hope that you would have strong sense of, of what's right and how we're going to protect the community. So. I, I do have a strong sense of, you know, protecting the community. And I think that's what uh, the trial courts had to do was do a balance, uh, safe, balancing the safety of the prisoner and the public safety. And so that's what I believe the trial judges were doing. Yes, but the decisions were made on the higher, uh, at the higher level. Um, and pushed um, for the release. And I'm just concerned that I think that uh, uh, judges need to have a voice and need to, uh, need to support or protect the community because these people that were released committed crimes and if it committed against your family, against your children, uh, again, I mean, you would be outraged. Um, you know, one victim is one too many. Uh, so I hope you will give that some serious thought. Thank you. I will. Thank you. I will. Members, any other questions? So, uh, Senator Ocasio, go ahead. Hello. Congratulations, Mrs. McCullen. Uh, nice to see you again. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Um, this is kind of a follow-up um, to Senator Kyoho Kalale, I, I believe, if, if I understood him correctly. But we did talk about this in just in in thinking about the systems of in, and, and the systemic injustice, and then we have precedent, uh, precedent set by other rulings that is coming from a place of maybe very much wealthy, white, um, colonial mentality, and that, you know, that judgment is held as precedent. So, you know, with, with this change that we want to see in the world, how do you, as a as, a, as an ICA judge, what role can you play in pushing those boundaries? Um, is there room to push the boundaries or, or to create new precedent from the lived experience that you have rather than the lived experience that these prior um, you know, judgments where they came from in terms of you know, whether, it's, whether it's white, male, wealthy, straight, you know, and, and, and so just kind of wanted to touch on that again and um, see if you can share where where those boundaries are that that you bring potential um, shift in that culture while, of course, still staying within the bounds of what you're interpreting as, as the law. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. So as for... Um creating precedent, the ICA is able to address issues of uh, first impression or novel issues. Uh, and to that extent, there is, uh, I guess, the ICA does have some power to do that, to create precedent that way or new precedent. But the ICA is bound by or limited to the record below and is also bound to press the Supreme Court precedent and law. The IC cannot overturn Supreme Court precedent. So in terms of addressing systemic injustice, where, where, do, you, where do you personally come in in terms of um, kind of re-examining some of these these, um, I guess if you can't overturn precedent, but where, where's the, where's the challenge? Where's the wiggle room? Where's the change? Um, and more speaking from what, what you bring, um, to the, to the bench. I guess there, there is some room where there is an issue of first impression, 
um, and where there is an issue of first impression, you, we can pull from, but uh, again, we're limited to the, we would be limited to the record below, the facts that were uh, developed below, and to also be limited to the way the issues were framed. So it's, it's a really difficult question and it's, it's kind of, it's hard to answer in the abstract um, because there really needs to be a live controversy for the ICA to address an issue. Um, yes, it's very difficult to answer in the abstract. I'm so sorry. Are you satisfied, Senator Ocasio? I, I yield to Senator Gilbert. Uh, before I go back to Vice Chair, um, Senator Gavitt or Senator Favela, do you want to take a, ask some questions or? Okay, I don't. It's seeing seeing them. Go ahead, uh, Vice Chair. Go ahead. Okay, so maybe let's maybe let's try. Uh, let me maybe we should try some questions about your record uh, in appellate practice. In, I believe in your opening statement, you said that on uh, a number of occasions you refused to make arguments that you, you know, on behalf of the prosecutor's office in appellate work that you thought were not appropriate. And I'm wondering if you can expound on that. Were those, uh, you know, like typical pro forma procedural claims that you thought would be unjustly applied, or were they just pragmatic considerations you thought you'd lose, or? Were there any arguments that you refused to make or that you could that you dropped on appeal that uh, may have had the systemic implications you know that we're that we've been alluding to here um well they they ranged they ranged it was kind of a wide range some dealt with um the denial of the right to testify or not to testify um, one comes to mind where there was a defendant who was claiming his sentence was illegal. And um, when I reviewed the record, for a long time we were, we were or the, the office was arguing that it was legal, but it was reassigned to me. And when I reviewed the record, I, I felt he was right that his sentence was illegal and we had to redo it. Um, so I actually helped the trial deputy to uh, concede below at a Rule 40 hearing and um, the court didn't agree because there was precedent for the court to rely on. Um, but it came to the ICA and again, I, or I wrote it up and I conceded that yes, his sentence was illegal and um, it was transferred to the Supreme Court and the Sup Hawaii Supreme Court and the Hawaii Supreme Court did agree. And so that's one example. Uh, so I guess that's a, that, but that seems like a black and white uh, legal consideration. I mean, do you have, were there any others where it just seemed like they might have had other systemic implications or, or do you think that that might have? Hmm. I, I would say that case not, and I'm, I'm trying to look at my list and, you know, I, yeah, I don't think so. I don't think any of them had a broader systemic implication. Oh, well, maybe one jury instructions. Actually, yeah, that's that. That would be um, that would. I'm sorry. I'm thinking of another case. <laughs> I apologize. There I'll was one. Another question, in case it comes back to you later. Okay, uh, I do have a couple of questions. Uh, so, when Governor sent down your nomination after we defeated uh, Daniel Glucks, um, and then I admit my first thought was, 
uh, naming someone out of the prosecutor's office where the prosecutor himself is a uh, has been the target of a federal investigation and one of the chief deputies has is already in prison serving a 13-year jail term uh, yeah there's some yellow flags went up so I would just ask you the question the fairly simple questions are, are you a target of any federal investigation at this point no I'm not I'm sorry can you can you not hear me no, you're not. Okay. No, no, you I'm not. A, no, you're not a target. Right. Have, you, have you received any? Have you had to testify at all in the either the Kaloha or the Kanashiro case? No, I have no. Has any federal investigator contacted you at all about those cases or any anything else? No. no. Okay. So for members of the public, the background is, of course, is that the public, the, uh, the prosecutor's office in Honolulu is a pretty large, if it were a law firm, it would be one of the largest in the state, maybe second only the attorney general's office. Uh, there's about 100 attorneys and about 170 additional support staff. Uh, I did, uh, I've, I have confirmed with uh, the appropriate authorities that what uh, Ms. McClellan has just said is true and accurate. So I won't raise the issue again, but I think it's, I think uh, I felt like I had to bring it up because um, people are people are suspicious and they think everybody's um, in cahoots with everybody else. And I think in this case that it, well, in this case that's clearly not true. So, members, any other questions? Senator Gabbard, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, Ms. McCullen, we received materials as part of your application, and. It, um, Part of that included a disciplinary history report involving a complainant, Donald B. Marks. And although the uh, it was dismissed, could you share with us an explanation of the circumstance? Um, actually, that was the case I was describing with the illegal sentence. Okay. Um, I, I was first assigned when it was in the federal side, and I was defending it on procedural grounds because it, it was late <laughs> and so anyway when we um went to the state side we conceded and i sent a, a notice to the federal side saying hey we're conceding this in in state court um yeah and so i'm I, sorry i don't know Ms. McCall, Ms. McCall and I, you broke up at least for me you broke up for uh, oh. about a 30 seconds can you can you start the answer for senator gabbard's question again okay so the, the, the case was the one I just described about the illegal sentence where I conceded. It actually started on, for me on the federal side. And um, when I, we were on the state side and conceding, I notified the federal side, the federal courts that we were conceding in the state. Um, but so I, I guess Mr. Marks, I, I, I don't know. I think he, he thought I was, I think he, his, his accusation was I had lied in one of the filings, but the, um, the ODC uh, dismissed it. They found no, uh, yeah, I didn't lie. <laughs> and ultimately we, we did concede and the, you know, that's the one the Supreme Court agreed that the sentence was illegal. So that was the case. Thank you. And what? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Senator Gabbard, go ahead. Oh, the question, Chair. And uh, Ms. McCullen, one of the testifiers mentioned that you participate in the Ette Bowl and uh, at your resume, I see that you, you play a linebacker uh, position. Will there be a game uh, uh, Ette Bowl in 2021? And will you be participating? Uh, um, well, practices are going on right now, so <laughs> I, I don't know if I'm in shape after it's two years of COVID or a year and a half of COVID, but I'll try. And the name of your team is the Bruisers, is that correct? That's correct, yes. Thank you, Thank you Chair. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Members, any other questions? No, uh, sure. here in, in law school, I was a coach of the law school women's Sorry. team, pretty, pretty poor offensive line coach. <laughs> Senator, Senator Favela, go ahead. Guys volunteering to coach her? 
Go ahead. Thank Senator. you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to thank you for um, meeting with me and uh, you know get to really um, get to kind of know um, a little bit more um, about you and your uh, your travels of uh, becoming a, a perspective of this position. What I really liked about your, your background, your resume, is that pretty much everything that you did, you got your education all locally. And that's very impressive, um, in, even in this day of time. But even when you went there, um, it was still challenging to have and be educated um, and, and do everything in Hawaii, to keep yourself in Hawaii um, and doing your, you know, just, just everything that, that you had represent um, going forward. And I know um, people had questions and they, they give you to ask questions about the uh, diversity of your um, um, going forward as a judge, but I wanna ask for you, uh, what is your perspective of you considered your, your greatest strengths and in your weaknesses? Um. I guess my greatest strength is listening and considering people's perspectives. Uh, I really try to do that. Um, I think one of my weaknesses is uh, when I'm working, I need to stop at some point because I do have other deadlines. And so, it, you know, I have to always regulate myself because I find you know, one research leads to another research and leads to another research. So I always have to, I have to uh, set boundaries. Going forward, um, we, we know, um, as you can tell the questions that you was getting going forward <clears throat> on, <clears throat> on our, um, your background as being um, Native Hawaiian and, um, you know, um, the complexity of our our court system um, in bringing trust and um, faith in the judiciary system. Um, going forward, um, what what else you think you could offer um, the community in in uh, bringing that forth to a lot of people that don't have faith in government, not only in the judiciary system, but in government and, and law, period. Well, Senator, I'm dedicated to working hard. I'm committed to learning what I need to learn to do this job. Um, and I hope, you know, I hope uh, I can be a good role model. Well, you are. And, and I told you that in the, in the meeting when we had, whether you believe it or not, um, coming from YNI, teaching YNI, you know, you could have chose any other schools to work for. Um, you chose YNI, which the district is one of uh, the largest, from not including to YNI, one of the largest um, Hawaiian communities. So that, you know, that says a lot about you. I just want to go forward in, in congratulating you in, in all your accomplishments into where you are at as a person, because it wasn't easy on both ways. Um, and, and I brought this up in the committee previously, um, just by using the word, I don't wanna use those words, but just judging on, on the qualifications, comparing um, other candidates and, uh, um, and, and a female candidate, um, the diversities that our women um, in power have to go through today. And that's the reason why I said, later on, you don't realize it by now, but as you go forward in your future and serving your 10 years, not leaving anytime soon, because I thought Senator Kim was going to bring that up, as you being young, will you serve your 10 years on the bench and not leave anywhere else? But um, knowing your dedication, um, I, I just, just want to congratulate you so far on your accomplishments up to now. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I did have another question about uh, so the vast majority of the cases that you've brought to the ICA and to the Supreme Court are, well, maybe all of them are from, on, from the prosecutor's office. And so 
uh, are on the criminal side. The ICA, of course, gets many cases that are not on the criminal side. And how, how are you going to, what are you going to do? How are you going to address that, that, um, uh, that, that relative weakness in your, in your resume? Um, so, Senator, I do have some civil experience at um, UPW and also at the Supreme Court clerking. Uh, at the Supreme Court, we had to work on all kinds of cases. And um, I had to review the entire record. I had to research the issues raised. Um, and I, have to, I had to assist the justice in drafting an opinion. And so I, I would, whether it's criminal or civil, I would apply those, those skills to whatever case I'm assigned. And also I'm committed to learning whatever I need to learn to do the job. Okay, similar question with regard to evidentiary, um, evidentiary decisions. So as you're aware, the, the appellate courts have various standards of review for different kinds of issues and for evidentiary questions, usually there's some deference, at least given to the trial court. How, how do you handle that now? Because obviously you're not going into, you're not trying the cases themselves at the, at the uh, trial court level. You get, you get them after somebody else has tried them. How do you deal with um, evidence cases now? Um, well, the, the rules of evidence, I think they were enacted in 1970 and the standard of reviews have pretty much been set, they're established. And um, when I review the record and appeal, um, I, over the, you know, my 13 years of experience, I think I've become uh, pretty good at spotting errors or uh, recognizing errors. And so I think I, I, I can do it. I've been doing it for the last 10 years at the prosecutor's office and also, um, you know, arguing before the Hawaii Supreme Court is, is really not easy. We have to know our stuff when we go before that. And, and I think, I think I have the experience to do that. Do you, do you ever consult with the, I mean, when, when you, when you go into an appeal, do you, is it standard practice in the office to consult with the per, pe, person or people who, the, the lawyers, the lawyer or lawyers who brought the trial court case when you, when you're looking at the appeal? Um, actually, no, because we're limited to whatever's in the record. And so, you know, if they, they remember something or, you know, there's something in chambers, we couldn't use it anyway. I mean, we're, we're limited to the record, so we review the record. Okay, so you're basically operating independently of the trial court uh, attorneys, the, the prosecutor's trial court attorneys? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, members, any other questions? Okay, seeing none, uh, thank you very much for your time. And as I mentioned before, uh, this is on, we're still, this is GM2, Governor's Message Number 2 for uh, Sonia McCullen for the Intermediate Court of Appeals. Uh, we will not be voting today, as I mentioned at the beginning of the hearing. Decision-making on this appointment will be tomorrow, August 26 at 10.30 a.m. via Zoom and live stream. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you very much for being here.